In the school system, there are many things that go beyond, for instance, police work. We actually look for tangible violence, you know, things we can see. You have to be concerned about things you can't see, the insidiousness, as I said, of, of students being too afraid to go to school, right? Of students going home and drinking or taking drugs to medicate the bullying that they receive at school. Students who become uh, maladjusted in these really sensitive early years as a result of being in fear all the time. We don't generally deal with that stuff in law enforcement, but you do, because you have an intimate relationship with your, with your students. Here's one of the problems that we have when we're talking about what scares us, the liability thing, right? I call it pop culture refereeing. Media sensationalism. You will not have a fight in school that won't make the paper. Accept it. You will never be involved in an altercation in school that won't make the paper. Accept it. Media loves that stuff. They love it. It's great stuff. It sells papers. We've had to deal with it forever in law enforcement. And by the way, whatever happened, there will be no resemblance in the paper of what actually happened. <laughs> Just accept that, understand that. It's the way it is, okay? It'll frustrate you, it'll make you angry, it'll make you stamp your feet and ball your fists. It's the way it is. It's not as good a story when we tell the truth, okay? When we actually do the investigative reporting that would expose what in fact happened. Another problem is laws are often ignored or misunderstood. We just saw this issue, and we're still seeing with stand your ground laws. People just don't get it. They don't understand it. They can't make heads or tails of the statute. So they offer an opinion that they think matters. And I'm a law guy, so we're going to talk a little bit about law and policy and how that, that reflects what we do. But this is a big problem. You're going to have intellectual conversations. By the way, they're going to be reasonable conversations with people who don't get it. They just don't get it, and they think they do. Because violence affects everyone, so we talk about it at home with our kids, with our spouses, with our friends, and we think we're well-educated, when in fact what we're doing is tossing around the same bad ideas, right? <coughs> Opinions are often driven by hindsight bias. Do you think it's easier to tell a story before or after the story's over? That's a silly question. <laughs> Most people who weigh in on what you do are looking at the story after it's over. You're not going to have that luxury if you're involved in the use of force, okay? You're having a healthy respect for the I don't know what's going to happen. And so they see it very differently, and we call this in psychology hindsight bias. And moral opinion substitute for ethical rules. Okay, so let's operationalize those two things. Morals, and I got no problem with morals, it's just that we all have different sets of morals. Do you agree with that? I mean, I, I can give a whole lecture on that. We see the world differently because of our experience, what our religion is, what our race is, what our gender is, where we grew up. All those kind of things affect our morality, right? And that's okay. We raise our kids to be kind of like us, right? But they don't always agree with the kid next door because their morals are different. Ethics are different. Ethics are rules for the group. So when you became a school teacher or a school administrator, there were certain rules you had to comply with. And you might not even agree with them. But because it's part of your job, it's an ethical standard to abide by that particular set of rules, right? So when you're talking to most people who don't share your experience in education, they're using a moral base from which to draw opinions. And you're arguing an ethical base. Cops have the same problem. Cops think it's crazy when somebody says, why didn't you shoot him in the leg? Well, it's because we don't shoot in the leg. We don't train to shoot in the leg. I can go on and give you a lecture about why we don't do that. But the public thinks we should, because it hurts less, I guess. So we get caught in that sort of vortex between moral understanding or moral argument and ethical understanding and ethical argument. What you're going to be doing as an administrator, as a teacher, as somebody in the um, world of education is not fighting. We don't fight. We use defensive techniques. We're always defending, right? So here's some basic rules that you just need to get familiar with as you pursue the career that you're in where we know trouble can happen. First of all, it's always defensive. We never retaliate. We don't ever hit somebody because it makes us feel good. We got rid of that when we were eight, right? Sometimes there are injuries. You have to accept that. When there is force, sometimes there are injuries. Matter of fact, it's quite common. If you're trying to use force that doesn't involve injuries, you are not using force. You're doing something else, okay? So sometimes there are injuries. And, again, if you 
paid attention to your last lecture, sometimes the effects are deadly. And that can be very frightening. If you have an active shooter that comes into your school, what are you going to do? Are you able and capable of using deadly force to solve this problem? And those are some of the questions that I think only cops used to have to ask themselves, cops and soldiers. But now it kind of comes down to you having to answer that question as well. So let's talk a little bit about a fight, because I want you to be familiar with it. I want you to know it when you see it. One of the biggest problems I notice, and I teach fighting all over the world, is that people don't understand what a fight looks like. Usually, when they get punched in the nose, they go, I'm in a fight! And that's late in the game, I think. So the pre-fight indicators are very important when it comes to understanding what's happening. And a lot of times, you're not going to be the, the, the subject of the assault. You're going to come up on two people fighting, or about to fight, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff we see in the school system. Doesn't mean it's always the case, but most of the time. So when you're paying attention, sort of, from the outside of the perimeter, these are kind of the things that you would see. And these are common for, actually, all species, but I'm going to try to stick as much as possible to humans. First thing you're going to see is somebody freeze. This is the old deer in the headlights, right? The freeze is a cognitive period where your brain has no thought. What's happening is <clears throat> the forebrain is starting, because of the alarm, to reduce its capacity, and the subcortical processes are starting to work. Those are the things that you often call fight-flight, right? And many of you guys, if you've ever been in a fight or you've been in a critical incident of any type, might have things like memory loss, perceptual distortion, slow motion timing. We hear all that stuff in serious fights. That's what happens during the freeze complex. You're getting all of these neural changes in your head. Generally what happens after you freeze, if you don't run away, which is the normal thing to do, if you don't turn and run away, and by the way, in your capacity, many of you can't, right? I mean, you have a, a moral and ethical obligation to not run away under most circumstances. Then you're going to have to do something else, because the threat's still there. And what we generally see happen is that you go into what we call posturing. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about posturing later on. But posturing is a pre-fight attempt to avoid the fight. You're trying to come across so overwhelming and so convincing in your posture that you are more than capable of dealing with this that you hope that it de-escalates the effect of the person that you're dealing with, right? But that doesn't always work, especially when you already come up on high emotional situations. And sometimes you might be forced to fight. Usually we see fighting occurring after them are trying to escape and then the posturing. That's usually when we see it. It doesn't just start. Fights don't generally just start. There's things that occur before them. Every now and then you'll come up on a kid or an adult who has been in a fight and has done the fourth thing, which in law enforcement we have to train out of our officers. I would love to spend more time with you and train it out of you as well. It's called submission. Submission is the person on the ground, curled up in a fetal position, with people standing around them and kicking them until they get tired. And that's not a good way to fight, okay? But we know that sometimes when you're overwhelmed, when your coping mechanisms are not capable of dealing with the onslaught of sudden violence, that you just simply submit. And I'm afraid a lot of teachers tend to be in this mindset. This is the, these are the people, or the, the officers, who said, if I have to carry a gun, I won't. They're not willing to use force. And I would submit to you, if you're sitting here today, under the sound of my voice, that all of you need to find a place in your mind to know that there may be a day that you have to fight, and you need to do your best, and not submit. Okay? But these are the, the four pre-fight indicators I talk about in court a lot. Now, a good friend of mine has termed this the monkey dance. I think it's a great expression. All primates do it. That's where he gets it. Perhaps in your school you've seen this up teen times. I don't know how many times you've run across somebody who's doing the monkey dance. It's very ritualized behavior. It's pulling the jacket off, pulling the shirt off, right? How many times have you come across a guy that's half naked and you're like, what the hell were they just doing? <laughs> that's a pre-fight indicator, right? You got two naked guys in the hallway and you're thinking, Wow, this is weird. It's not weird to me. I see that all the time. It's the first thing you do. <laughs> you rip the shirt off. It has no bearing on anything. But you take it off. You posture. Your mama. No, your mama, right? And they're doing that. And you're wondering who this mama they're talking about. And they're just looking at each other, right? Hold me back, they're telling their friends. 
Sometimes they say, please, you know, because they're, it ain't working, right? So hold, hold me back. We blade the body. We blade the body. We tend to step back in law enforcement. We teach it because that's where a gun is, right? We pull it out of the fight, if you will. But people will tend to do this normally. I suspect it has more to, and they're not aware they're doing it, more to do with shall I stay or shall I go? I think that's what it has a lot to do with. That's still sort of that fight flight thing, right? Am I in or am I out? When they go to combat, by the way, they will square. You don't get a deer coming through your window sideways. They always come head first. When they go like that, they turn and look at you because that's a normal instinctual thing. But during the fight, they will tend to blade. This is a pre-fight avoidance. Trembling, shaking, serious shaking. What's happening here is, again, this all has to go back, this goes back to your neural system. You're getting a sympathetic nervous response. You're starting to deteriorate based on fear in terms of your fine motor skills, your complex motor skills are going away. You're turning into a gross motor skill animal. You're a big, hairless, clawless, fangless, ape, and that's what we generally see, Blah, they grab each other, right, and then you see that in the hallway as well. Um, even skilled people do that because they lose control of fine motor skills. Bumping, it's that arms back thing, this is all part of posturing. Bumping is I am heavier and bigger than you. It's not a good tactic for smaller people. But you will see people bumping when they feel as if this effect gives the person a little taste of what they're in for if they keep on, okay? Very common. Shoving, same thing. This is a lot of times what we call creating distance in my business. It's an intentional push off of the arms. It's not intending to fight. If it was fighting, it wouldn't be shoving, it'd be grabbing, right? So this is an indicator that you have a little time to work with. Serious and specific swearing, I have a book that's called Why We Swear, it's an interesting book, it's actually quite amusing, written by a PhD. Swearing is very emotional, it's emotional talk. When you hear swearing, and it's very hard for me to stand in front of you and not swear because I get passionate about this stuff and all kinds of stuff comes out of my mouth, but when you get passionate about something, especially if you're about to be in a fight, you'll hear a lot of swearing, sometimes it's even directed at you. What you're hearing is emotion, you're actually hearing emotion come out, because swear words by themselves have no actual meaning. They're intending to create greater emotion within the immediate environment. Apes, generally, you'll hear a lot of cackling. They get louder and cackle. I'm, well, they may understand each other, but we certainly don't. And target glancing tends to mean if you're going to run, you'll look to where you're going to run first. If you're, if you're a SRO and you're standing there and the, and the student looks down at your gun, probably means they're going to attack your gun. Probably means that's what's coming next. So pay attention to those kind of things, target glancing. Three things happen during threat display in general. First thing is you try to appear larger. Pull your arms back, you push your chest out. Everybody does it. You try to look bigger than you are. You become louder. Have you ever noticed that? When somebody's mad at you, they raise their voice. You're like, calm down. Just relax. relax. They become louder, right? And then they usually will turn colors. Now, all animals do this, right? They all become larger. You've probably seen you know, the pre-fighting sequences of lizards that put that big thing out, right, in the red, whatever that is, that weird thing under their chin. Or you'll see peacocks, the plumage will come up. Most birds, plumage will come up. They'll turn red, right? They look like this guy. So this is a common angry person. And I know he's angry and he's about to fight because he's demonstrating these threat sequences. He's bigger than life. Look where his shoulders are. They're pulled up here. Right? Look how red he is. And from the posture of his mouth, he's probably not whispering. He's probably shouting. Common display. That's another example. Um, let's talk about authority as I race through my presentation. How come you can do what you can do? What provides you the authority? And this is so important because our job is not to avoid lawsuits. Our job is to win them. So we have to know what it is the game, if you will, that we have to play to be successful at winning. What provides you the authority, if you were to have to use force, what would give you the authority to do that? How would you know you're on good ground, stable, solid ground? How could you go home when it was done and not tremble at the thought of what might happen tomorrow? How could you do it? Well, there's four things, since you all don't want to play long. <laughs> there's four things that grant you authority. And, and these are very generic. Um, base things, and if I was teaching just to Florida people or just to Georgia people or just to Mississippi people and so on and so on, I could be a little more specific.
But what's important is that you understand these base things. These are things you have to comply with. This is the ethical circle that we talked about earlier. These are things you have to comply with. It's like an inverted triangle. Now, this side represents you using force. This side represents your frustration in trying to document force, okay? Which we've all had. I'm not sure what happened. They want me to write about this. I'm going to tell you what happened and what you need to comply with because that matters. If you're consistent with these four things, you're going to win the lawsuit. You're going to win the discipline. You're going to win all the bad things that could happen to you tomorrow. And the first one is federal law. You might not know this, but law enforcement was responsible for narrowing this down so that we can actually understand it. We were the first ones sued all the time. We were the ones that everyone liked to step on. We were the ones that um, took the initial beating in the 1960s during the civil rights era. And I, man, I got a whole big lecture on this if you want to hear it one day. We were the ones that helped the Supreme Court get in there and say, well, this is what we'll allow. Okay? We helped shape federal law, and we're proud of it. Really, two things under federal law, if we can keep it constitutional, that you're trying to avoid. One is cruel and unusual punishment. That's the Eighth Amendment, okay, for some of you scholars. And the second one is that you have to be reasonable, and I'm going to talk all about that. That's where this, this is heading. This term reasonable is a little bit difficult to understand for many people, still hard for me to describe. It's more of a model than it is a definition. But if you are reasonable and you're not cruel and unusual in your administration of justice or force, you're going to be okay. You are. Probably. There's some other tailored things in here, like oh, state law. Well, don't forget about the red one. I can't go back with this thing. State law helps define more specifically. If I said to you, don't be cruel and unusual and stay reasonable, you, you'd feel great. You'd be like, oh, that's all I have to do? So what happens is your state says, well, that's a little bit hard for us to decide that you did the right thing or not. So state law arises, I think in Florida it's 232, it's more specific, right? Other states have different statute numbers, that more specifically tells you this is what we expect of you. Most statute reflects what I told you about federal policy, it's got to be reasonable. Can't be cruel and unusual. Most state law. So it's not a big help. It doesn't tell you exactly what to do when Timmy says, screw you. That's not in statute. You won't find it. Don't look for it. But it will say there are things that you can't do that are broadly um, weighed in on by the legislature. So make sure you know your statute when you leave here. I don't have time to give you it, but make sure that you figure out what it is and you apply it. The next thing, of course, is policy. Policy comes from your school district, comes from your school, your principal, from your superintendent. Those are the policy-making folks within your area. They're the ones that are really specific about what can and can't be done. And this is where the ta tail I see start wagging the dog. Because they're afraid of getting sued, they tell you, don't ever touch, don't ever do this, don't ever do that. It's nuts, it's crazy. But we see policy that is distorted because of the fear of vicarious liability. It gets distorted because it is so specific. It's, it's always easier to say no, isn't it? Have you noticed, how many people here are parents? I mean, a kid says something, he goes on for 10 minutes, you know, you're not getting it all, you just go, no. It's easier, it's just easier. You don't have to sit and think about it and brain it out and, my, I wonder if you know, somebody's gonna get hurt or if this is gonna cost me money, you know, no. Many times that's how administrations work. It's just easier to do that. So your policy, turns out, is a lot of what? No's. <laughs> And that's, that can be dangerous. Now all of a sudden we're not safe anymore because there are sometimes you have to say yes to force. Sometimes you have to say yes to I'm gonna use force. Sometimes you have to say yes, I'm gonna kill. Sometimes you have to say that. And you have to do that. So I caution you to take a look at your policy. Perhaps some of you who are policy makers, keep this in mind. Some of you that help form and shape policy will look at existing policy to see if there are holes there, right? As much as, poli as possible, policy should be discretionary. It shouldn't say shall, must, will, should be discretionary. Ought to is a better way to say it, right? And then finally, the most, probably the most important thing is training. And I don't know how much training you do. This is kind of new in the area of education for use of force, but it's really important. If I tell you that you're going to be using a control hold, but you don't know any control holds, you kind of got a problem. So at what level, who pays for this? There's a lot of good questions about it. I don't know. But training becomes very important. Without training, you don't even understand policy or statute or federal law. 
So training has to be good and it has to be effective and thank you for coming today because that's exactly what you're doing. When is it appropriate? Different for teachers than it is for law enforcement officers. You have a different environment. You operate under different facts and circumstances. Cops very rarely use force when it's harmful to learning. You would do it by statute. You're allowed to by policy. You're allowed to use force when the conditions that you're in are harmful to learning. You can use force when the conditions are harmful to the student's mental health. If you reasonably perceive that somebody is being adversely affected mentally based on what's going on, you can take action. What kind of action we'll talk about later, but you can take some action. You're covered. Policy allows it. Statute allows it. Conditions harmful to students' health. This is probably what most of your um, imagining as I talk about conditions, you're imagining people fighting, clearly that's harmful to somebody's health. But it could be other things as well. Somebody throwing something, right? Just sort of aimlessly throwing something. Gotta put a stop to that. Running in the hallway, I remember being scolded more than once for that. You have to pay attention to those things. You're allowed to take action to stop that from happening. Conditions harmful to safety, very broad, very general. Anytime it's a safety issue, you should step in. I do a lot of scenario-based training, a lot of it. It's the first thing I tell the students that are involved in my scenarios. I don't care what you're trying to do. I don't care what you're going to do in response to what that person is doing. If there is a safety issue, everyone stops. If I say stop, if you're like this, that's how you should end up, just like this, until I say go, because something's happened that you didn't see. I would say that it's probably more important in your environment when you've got a lot of kids and you see a safety issue, you jump on that right away. And then, of course, actual harm and or injury to self, school personnel, or others. Some of your policy may allow harm to property. Okay? Some may not. I've, I've seen great debate on this issue on whether or not you can stop somebody from damaging something or if you're just the eyes and ears that reports it later. But you'll have to check your policy for that. So let's talk about this word. Because this is what everything is based on. When you're defending yourself, when you're doing your reporting about what happened, you have to show a level of reasonableness. Who knows what reasonableness means? Wow, we're in trouble. <clears throat> how many people here are reasonable? OK, so how do you know? This is always the problem. I've trained cops that have been cops for over 25 years, and they don't know what this means. And everything they do is hinges on this concept. And, I, and, and there's a lot to be said about reasonableness. What is reasonableness? Is it, I don't know, whether you make your kids come home at 10 o'clock at night, they have a curfew, whether or not you don't let them drive till they're 17. Are those reasonable things? Perhaps. But it gets a little weird when, the, when your neighbor lets them drive at 16 and allows them to stay out till 11, and that's reasonable too, right? So who's the... Who's the guide of reasonableness? Well, back to what I originally said, reasonableness is an ethical thing in our, in our area, not a moral thing. If you look at reasonableness from your own perspective, well, this is what I would do, and that's how people weigh in on things. You could be in trouble, because the rest of us might not agree. But if you look at things from the perspective of this is how it needs to be done based on federal, state, policy, and training requirements, we all have to agree. I do a lot of civil court testimony. You know what they call that in civil court? Jury instructions. That's what they call it. They say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't care if you think that this person did the right or wrong thing. That's irrelevant in court. What I care is that when we give you the policies and the statute, that you tell us whether or not they abided within those parameters. That's what they say. That's why some weird jury decisions come back, and you're like, how could they do that? It's because they have jury instructions. They're limited to, what the, to the decision. Of course he did it. That's what self-defense is. You know, I spend so much time dealing with people who, I interview a lot of killers, people who have killed in self-defense. I believe they've used self-defense. They're in prison for it. Sometimes it's just easier for law enforcement to throw them in jail and let the court sort it out, forgetting that they sit there for three years before they get trial, right? We've got to start teaching people how to defend themselves to say, yeah, I did it. Now why don't you ask me why I did it? And that's where we're heading with our documentation, because that's, that's a standard that you'll be under. This is the best thing I can come up with. It's not great. The term objectively reasonable is the true and most accurate legal standard when both teaching use of force and 
when you're evaluating past use of force. So this is interesting because reasonableness has to be understood by everyone within your profession. If you learn the standards of reasonableness but your boss doesn't know them, we got a problem, right? Because they don't have any jury instructions. <laughs> They're making decisions based on what? Well, I wouldn't have done that. How many of you have ever suffered that in life? Happens a lot, right? I wouldn't have done that. Well, that's not the question. The question is, were you allowed to do that? That's the question. And by the way, it may not be a good decision. I, I submit to you, if you end up having to kill somebody, that's a bad thing. I, I, I don't want to argue that that's a good thing, but I will tell you this. It might be a very necessary thing. And it might be a very reasonable thing under the, under the given circumstances. And you have to accept that. And we do a lot of debriefing of people who kill using what I call moralistic violence, soldiers and cops. Because a lot of them end up with PTSD and stuff like that. They have a hard time with it because they just don't have it right in their head. We got to get it right in their head. I got to get it right in your head. You have to come to an understanding that reasonableness is sticking within the parameters and rules of your profession, not what mommy taught me, okay? They're different. Here's the definition you'll see in court. I hate when you define a word using the word, but you're in accordance with reason. What does that mean? There's a thought process, right? Reasoning is done with the prefrontal cortex. It's done with this thing, this part of your brain that most animals don't share, and if they do, it's a lot smaller. The ability to put together facts, circumstances, ideas, create arguments, balance, use proportionality, stuff like that. If you are able to do that, you're reasoning. In other words, you have to describe what you did. You can't just go, done, like you just roped a calf and go home. You gotta tell somebody what you did and more importantly, why you did it. That's the first part. Second part, not extreme or excessive, that's your Eighth Amendment thing. Whenever the fight is over, the fight is over. Do you think you'll be angry if somebody attacks you? I do too. But the hard part is not letting that anger manifest itself in that next kick, right? That's the hard part. You're a professional, that's the difference. Now you'll see kids, after the guy has said, uncle, still getting beaten, because they don't have a professional standard like you do. They're operating what? Morally. Daddy told me if you fight me, I'm supposed to beat you down, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, and your district is going to tell you, when the fight is over, it's over. And you have to be able to get that much control of your emotional self, or you are going to end up in trouble. You can hit somebody 100 times. And if they say uncle on the 100th time, and you hit them 101 times, that's called excessive force. The first 100 were OK. It's the 101st that was not OK, and you'll lose. You can't win the lawsuit then, right? You probably have cameras everywhere. They are counting them, all right? So we know what reasonableness kind of, what makes it objective? Well, there's a three-part test to objectivity. The first one is, what would an ordinary person do? It's hard to query everybody and say, what would you do? But it's what you guys might relegate to common sense. Personally, I don't believe in common sense, but I believe that it would be something that most of us would agree is okay. And that's a little hard to get our arms around, certainly if you don't know what we do for a living. So the people that should be judging us are the people who would look at our statute, federal law, policy, and training, and draw their conclusions from what's allowable, not what I would have done again. You'd have to present them with the same facts and circumstances. How do you do that? How could you actually present the same facts and circumstances? Take them out there and say, here, come here. Start punching and kicking them, say, this is what I was dealing with. Probably not, not the best way to do it. You may want to do that, but it's not the best way to do it. I would say through documentation, right? And then the third thing, knowing what the person knew at the time. So if you have somebody that didn't come to a training class, they couldn't be expected to know the same things you know, right? So that basically all things being equal. This is all, it used to be called the reasonable man test. Now we call it the reasonable person test. Um, it basically means what others who are in the same capacity seeing the same set of facts and circumstances would have done also. That's the reasonable standard. <clears throat> James Bond is not an objective, reasonable standard, okay? He may be your hero. He overacts sometimes. Let's talk about how we know what's right. This is a little framework that we've used in law enforcement. I thought about being creative and coming up with one, especially for you, so you could call it your own. But I figured the problem with that is that the first time we took it to court, they'd say, has this ever been used before? And you'd say, no, Roy just taught it to me. 
So what I want to share with you is something that we've been using in law enforcement. I changed the words a little bit, but it's the concept of a force continuum, and it has really two major parts to it. One part is what's called proportionality, means one thing is proportional to the other thing. And the other part is escalation and de-escalation, because that's how fights work. Fights go from not so bad to really bad, and then really bad to not so bad. And you have to be able to recognize during the course of that fight precisely where you are and be able to take action with respect to that. We generally look at it in this particular matrix. I have six levels of what I'll call threat, and I have six levels of what I will call um, response. In law enforcement, we call it um, resistance, but you're not making arrests, you're using force to defend yourself and others. So the first level is what we call presence. Why would presence be a threat? I mean, presence is you're just there, right? You're not necessarily doing anything. Why would it be a threat? I'll tell you. <laughs> because sometimes, you, no, all the time you make decisions based on what that person appears to be, right? If they seem angry, you're going to approach them differently than if they aren't angry. If they're twice your size, you might not approach them at all. If they've got a gun, you might find cover. And by the way, they might just have a gun. They might not be pointing at anybody. I'm not saying it's okay, but, but the facts and the circumstances are you observe certain things that dictate what you do next. On the contrary, you also have presence. I'm pretty sure when you show up in the school, the kids change their behavior to some degree, okay? Whatever they're doing wrong, probably they stop doing wrong when you're there. And then when you leave, they start again. So your presence affects them as well. It is a level of response. Right? Sometimes you just show up and do this. And you look and they scatter, they go into the class and it's done. And that's okay. That's a perfectly legitimate, legitimate use of force. We learn that in law enforcement. That's why we take cars home. I know you're upset about that. But we take cars home because here's what we found out. There's no crime at the police station. So when we allowed cops to drive cars home, guess what happened? We lowered the crime rate wherever the cars are. People respond to presence very, very well. Okay? Next thing, verbal. Verbal threats, I'm gonna do this to you, I'm gonna do that to him, you're this, you're that, all that kind of stuff. What can you do against somebody who's giving you verbal resistance, can you hit them over the head? Well, you could, but it wouldn't be proportional. What you can do is you can holler back at them. Sit down, shut up, right? And that's what most of you do. <laughs> you're being loud, sit down, leave, go over there. Get out of my class. Those are the kind of things that we should expect from our staff, to respond to problems based on this level of proportionality. Sometimes people get passive, right? So you say to them, uh, leave the classroom, and they don't. They just sit there looking at you. They're not a threat to you in an obvious way, but they're not doing what you say. What can you do? Well, in my world, we would actually teach you physical control. You can go over there, you can assist them. Certainly your SROs can get called in the classroom. They would assist them. We're not hitting them, we're not injuring them, we're helping them comply. That's what we're doing, and we're doing it with little to no chance of injury. It's a very low level force. We have different ways of, we have our ways of teaching people to do things that they need to do because it's the rule, right? But it should remain low level. Your tendency might be to get angry, to walk up and give them a good kick. I get it, you just can't do it. Active resistance now, or active threat, I'm sorry, is when somebody is in fact attacking you, right? Somebody is actually doing something that causes you to believe Wow, I'm in danger. This might be somebody who's charging at you, throwing fists at you, throwing kicks at you, picking up something and looking like they're going to throw it at you. That's active resistance. It is a danger to you. It's different than passive, where they're just sitting there. Your response? Protective measures. And I got a bunch of those too. We can teach you how to punch, we can teach you how to kick back, we can teach you how to block, we can teach you how to duck and jive and all that kind of stuff. That's really what I enjoy doing, getting you on the mats and showing you how we avoid getting injured when somebody's attacking us, okay? I don't know what you're doing in your school, if there is any provision of that. There doesn't have to be. Most of you have a good sense, it's built in, it's hardwired in your neural circuitry to be able to defend yourself using arms and legs and things like that. You don't have to be Bruce Lee to be a teacher. Good Lord, I hope that never happens. So, but you can hit if, they are, if it's an active threat, you certainly can. And I don't care what your policy says. State law says in every state that I know of, you don't have to get your ass kicked to do your job. Okay? That's what it says. There's no requirement for getting your ass kicked as a teacher in any of the 50 states. Just know that, okay? The next thing, aggressive. Aggressive is greater than just the push, the shove, that kind of thing. This is somebody who perhaps you're on the ground and they're beating on you. It's a high level, high level of attack. You find yourself in great danger. 
great danger, okay? Your response, what we call temporary incapacitation, you can start going for areas like the head, the neck, right? Certain areas, the solar plexus, that cause dysfunction, that cause the body to actually stop working. So we teach tactics and techniques that are temporary incapacitation in their orientation. This is the most dangerous, we call it an aggravated threat. Aggravated threats are based on the idea, usually that the person has a weapon. If somebody takes a broomstick, holds it up, coming at you, that's an aggravated threat. We shoot people for that stuff. We say you shouldn't have brought a broom to a gunfight, that's what we say. <laughs> you don't have guns, I get it, but you are in equal danger, I promise you. You can use deadly force. You can pick up a chair and hit them back. Okay? You can do those things by law. You are not required to die to be a teacher in the state of, well, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Virginia, and on and on. You're not required to die for your job. So as long as you accept that, we hope this never happens to you, but should it happen to you, you should be ready. <laughs> Does this look familiar to any of you? After it's over, right? After it's over, you've done a good job. Everyone comes running to you, wanting to know what happened, right? They're shouting at you, what happened, what happened? Well, the smart thing to do is to collect your thoughts before you start talking. Because the, everyone you talk to is called a witness. <laughs> we refer to them as witnesses, okay? Even if they had nothing to do with it, the moment they speak to you, they are now part of that investigation. And you're gonna feel like they're hollering at you, especially your bosses, right? with a big old megaphone in your ear. And you need to calm yourself, relax, collect your thoughts, and document. Does that look familiar to you at all? There's a lot of miscommunication um, when you're documenting. What people perceive to have happened versus what actually happened can cause huge problems. And as I understand it, we've had problems in our area with people who have done perfectly well but ended up getting in trouble because they didn't write it right. They didn't document it right. They didn't know what to say. They spoke out of their emotion, not out of reason, right? So there was a tremendous amount of miscommunication. Well, that can be costly in your business. They're, they're giving you your one chance to say what happened, to put you on the stage and to let you tell us what happened. This is not what you want happening. Here's what I advise. Get a cup of coffee. Sit down and close your eyes and picture what you saw. Picture in your mind what happened. You want to be able to create a snapshot so others can review it later, that it looks just as clear to them as it did to you, so you have to write it really well. You can't say, say something like, you know, saw a student, had fight, period. That's not sufficient, that's not a picture. You have to be able to analyze what it was you saw and write the details of that down so that we can see it too. And we can be reasonable with you when we're, when we're making our decisions, whether it be administratively or in court or the nice police officers there saying, you know, this could be a battery, right? You have to be able to know what to say. What's the severity of the offense? What were you responding to? What happened? Why were you even there? What did you perceive? That matters. Write it in your report. Were you bigger than them? Smaller than them? Were there more of them? Were there more of you? Do you think that matters? Do you think people have more sympathy for a very small teacher fighting a very large student than they will the other way around? Of course they will. Of course they will. Can you use different levels of force? Would a very small student against a very large, uh, a very small teacher against a very large student be able to use a greater amount of force than a very large teacher against a very small student? Yes, because it's reasonable, right? Makes sense. Makes sense to people. Patterns of behavior. This is why did I think a fight was about to start? What was happening when I observed the fight? What made me think whatever I thought? Because it turns out you could be wrong. That's the other interesting thing about our business. We can write it all out and we're wrong. They were just playing, right? That happens, but that doesn't matter as I'll share with you in just a few minutes. Potential danger, physical and other. Potential danger to you, to other students. Why'd you have to stop this now? Or did you have to stop it at all? Why couldn't you run and get somebody else? Why couldn't you call for the SRO? Was this out in the middle of a field somewhere? Or was it right in the middle of a very busy hallway? That would matter. What's the potential of danger to others, to you, to staff, to the students, the ones engaged? Tell us. What's your availability of assistance? When you wander into a fight where you're outnumbered, there's a word for that, I can't, it's um, foolish, okay? It's foolish to wander into a fight when you're outnumbered. It's better to let them beat the hell out of each other than for you to get 
beaten up, and they get beaten up too. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? So you want to and analyze that. And by the way, if you don't take action, should you write why you didn't take action? Of course. Because there were six of them fighting. And they were all bigger than me. And I wasn't going in there. And I get it. And by the way, in law enforcement, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We don't wade into the middle of six people fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. We watch. We shout. We call for help. And we see what happens. That's the way we do it. Actions taken prior to the use of physical force. Do you think they're going to know what you tried to do but didn't work? Yeah, that's what I call the force matrix or the force continuum, right? I, I, I told them to stop. I tried to pull them off. I had to hit them in the head. But I did these other things first. That shows what? Escalation of force, which is entirely reasonable. I just shared the model with you. So don't just say, I walked up and I hit Timmy in the head, period. Some of your reports turn out that way. And I busted his eye. We don't say those kind of things in our reports. It may be true, by the way, but that's not how we write it, right? We say, I observed a student on the ground, another student, I'll tell you about all that kind of stuff, and we detail why we did what we did and the things that we did before we did what we did to try to avoid having to do what we did. Threat perception, your perception of the threat as it occurred and your actions based upon that threat remain more important than what might actually be discovered after the fact. This might come as a surprise to you, especially to some of you who read the newspaper and weigh in on law enforcement stuff and you think you know what's going on and you go, well, I can't see why he did that. Well, he did that because he didn't know what you know. He did that because he was facing a, a circumstance that at that time was a total unknown. And they took action as a result of, of it being unknown and it turns out it wasn't what he thought it was. It happens a lot. Man, we, you've heard stories, right? I mean, we pull cars over and we end up shooting the guy that gets out and he hasn't done anything, but we thought he was the robber. And he just came out with something in his hand and we thought it matched up what we perceived would have likely happened if we in fact did stop the robber. Those are called bad facts, it's true. We settle those all the time. We have a lot of bad facts in our business. But your perception is what matters. What did you think was gonna happen? Forget about what we know happened. What did you think was gonna happen? That's what we wanna write in our report. Stick to your facts. What will happen is they're going to come in and they're going to say, well, I don't know if you knew this, but blah, 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 blah. That doesn't belong in your report. That's an after-the-fact fact. You write your narrative based on what you reasonably believe at the time, even if you know you're wrong when you're writing it. I'm not asking you to make things up. I'm saying that you had a perception. I don't, look, if any of you guys got in this business because you want to fight, you don't need me, okay? You need a psychologist, right? <laughs> That's not why you became a teacher. You became a teacher to teach. If you're in a fight, it's because bad things have happened around you. I believe that. Tell us what those bad things are. That's what we want to know. Parts of a threat. You have to demonstrate, as I wrap this up, that the person had the ability to do whatever you thought they were doing. You have to demonstrate that the person had the opportunity. Let me give you an example, for instance. And I'll use a weapon. If I have a knife in my hand, and I'm dealing with this gentleman up front here in the green shirt, I have the ability to cause him great harm. Do you agree? But knives don't cut that far away. So I don't have the opportunity, right? Now, on the contrary, if you saw me walking towards him, what would I start to have? Well, both, because I still have the ability, but now suddenly I got the opportunity. And yeah, I've heard the argument you can throw knives, with, but no. Um, the, the knife is dangerous here, okay? So this is the opportunity. So I want you to dissect that in your reporting, in your narrative. Had the ability, had the opportunity, and I believe that the person was in fact in jeopardy. I can tell you right now, many of you are sitting here with a gun on your hip, I saw that, I was paying attention. You have the ability to kill me, you have the opportunity to kill me, but you don't want to kill me. I don't think. <laughs> but I am watching you. <laughs> Until you make some kind of an action to make me feel as if my life is in danger, I'm not in jeopardy. So jeopardy has to be described as well. I believe this was going to happen. Saw Joe with a knife, approached Tommy, thought he was going to cut him. You're talking about three parts, three major parts, to building your effective, reasonable narrative. Okay? And then the last one is what I call preclusion. Preclusion means there's really nothing else you could have done. Some people call this necessity. In statute, you'll say, oh, you can only use the force that is necessary. Have you ever heard that term or that, that phrase before? You can only use the force that's necessary. Necessary means you needed to do it, like there wasn't any other thing you could do. There you were. It was happening. And so you took action. You needed to take action. This is preclusion. It also allows you an opportunity to say, well, I could have done this, but I didn't because I found another option, which is, by the way, what you all should be training for. 
other options, right? We don't want to fight. It's not what we want to do. But if you fight, tell us why you had to fight. Well, I'll let you just kind of look at that. How many of you guys have use of force reports? Or after action reports, things like that. If you get in a fight, if you end up breaking up a fight, if there's somebody has, there's violence around you, do you have a special form you fill out? Shake your head like this. Okay. So some of you do, shake your head like this if you don't. Okay. If you don't, make one. Make one. Because this is what's going to show up in two years when you have already done 700 more days of schooling. You're not going to remember the, what you did. But the attorney will, right? They're going to know exactly what happened. You need to be able to pull a document that has these facts spread around it so that you can effectively recall, oh, yes, I, you know what? I do remember that. This is what's going to jog your memory. This is what's going to give you the juice you need. It's a roadmap for reasonableness. It's a roadmap for reasonableness. That's what it is, a blueprint. And I see in my self-defense cases as one of the biggest problems with citizens who get in fights, use force to protect themselves, and they go to prison. Why? They didn't know what to say. Cop didn't ask him to write it down. Cop said, tell me what you did, <laughs> right? And by the way, if a cop ever asks you anything, don't answer. Um, it never does you any good. That's been my experience. Um, we are looking for inculpating evidence, stuff that makes you more guilty, right? Because we're building a case that's called probable cause. So you have to put all the facts down yourself. You have to be your own investigator. That's why the forum's so important. Know what you, questions you need to answer before you get in the fight. Don't sit back under stress and duress and the guy with the megaphone in your ear saying what happened, trying to figure out what you need to say. That's just a bad idea. As much as possible, your use of force support, if they're not like this, they should be. If you don't have one, you should build it like this. Leave out the narrative as much as possible. The problem is because you're not trained in discussing use of force. You don't know exactly the right words to say. You don't exactly know what not to say. The courts know, it's called case law. There's been plenty of things. You know, when you say something like, um, you know, I, I bludgeon the student with my fist. I mean, it's a bad thing to say. It, it could be true. But that's not how we say it. We say, I struck the student, right? We don't want to talk about the degree of injury in the narrative, good Lord. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of some of the language by creating this kind of a text box. You see, that's pretty descript. And each section, this is just one really sort of myopic part of a use of force report, not a complete use of force report. This is how they mostly should look. You do want a narrative section because you do want the, the, the teacher to put in certain facts and circumstances that they, that they will be able to recall in two years or five years sometimes. But keep it kind of short, right? Whoop. I got to go back. <coughs> this is an example of a narrative laced with nothing inflammatory. You'll notice here I won't talk about degree of injury. If you can't see it, it says, I observed several students hollering and screaming in a circle in the west wing. They were focused on something in the center. As I approached, I saw two students fighting in the middle of the circle. Mark Johnson was on the ground, and William Jefferson was over him, repeatedly striking Johnson in the head with his fist multiple times. I managed to push through the crowd, grab Jefferson under both arms. As I did, Jefferson turned towards me and drew back his fist as if to strike me. Fearing for my safety, I spun around and pushed Jefferson into the wall to immobilize him and prevent further attack upon me or any other. Jefferson immediately relented to my control and became passive without further incident. I suffered no injuries. Johnson suffered several contusions and lacerations to his face, and he was provided medical treatment by EMS. Jefferson did not appear to be injured. Who caused the contusions? One of the students, right? You will talk about the degree of injury when you're talking about what you're observing. But if you end up having to strike Jefferson in the face and you cut him, you struck him in the face. We'll have a section at the bottom that says injuries. It'll say laceration to the face. That softens the effect that juries hear when the narrative is read. Do you understand that? It's all true. It's just how you, it's how you frame it. Okay? But we do want to know that whatever we did was necessary because what was happening? This kid had several lacerations in his face. I didn't cause them. That's what I saw. Those are the injuries he suffered. So that would belong in the narrative. You understand that? You want to present it correctly. If you start putting in there things that are inflammatory, they're going to come back and get you. This is a very simple narrative. It doesn't take three, four, five pages to, to write. And by the way, when you're emotional, you may want to write three, four, five pages. Bring your diary with you. Okay? Don't write it in your, uh, in your official reports. Something called volition. Police have been using this for years. Ask a cop, do you shoot to kill? What do you say? What do you say? We don't shoot to kill. I say we put two in the chest, one in the head. Ask your doctor. Okay? That's where we shoot. But we never say that. Why? Because we, we never form intent to kill. We have what's called volition. 
Volition means we're trying to accomplish something else. We shoot to stop things from happening. Do you understand? You see the difference? This matters. If you shoot to kill, if I shoot you and you're dead and you're not dead, I walk up and shoot you again. That's shooting to kill. Do you see the difference? If I shoot you one time, even though I meant to shoot you twice, but one missed, and you stop, do I shoot you because I missed? No, because the threat has stopped. This is volition. This is how you need to present your narratives. Narrative must account for a calculation of the need to use force rather than just to describe the end product. I struck Timmy in the eye and it bled. That is not a good narrative, okay? Injuries should be listed in the injury section of the report. You should have a section that says injuries. You, others, you know, that kind of thing. You do check marks if you like. Contusions, lacerations, broken bones, uh, gunshots, slashes, you can do that kind of stuff. Help your people out if you want. In other words, at the heart of the description is your intent to stop an imminent threat rather than an intent to necessarily injure or harm another person. So just get those two things right. The intent to do something is called criminal, okay? If you're intending to hurt somebody, if you're intending to kill somebody, it's, it, it falls under the battery statute, sometimes aggravated battery, sometimes it could even be homicide, right? But if you're, if, you're, if you're doing what you're doing to stop the person from doing what they're doing, you don't form intent, you form volition. You're trying to stop something from happening, which is why you used the force that you did. So these are some of the resources I used in giving you this information. I think you can tell I got a lot more, but I know it's lunchtime, and I probably already overstayed my welcome. Um, I want to thank you all for inviting me here. It's been a pleasure. Um, this is my information. If you want to contact me, I do lectures all over the place. I'm happy to come do one for you as well. I think there's a lot of work to be done in this particular area. If you have any questions, I will take them for maybe five minutes before you leave. If you don't want to stay, you won't hurt my feelings. It's fine. But at this moment, I'll just open the, the floor for questions. Anyone? Damn. I did a good job. Oh, you have one. Okay. So for instance, if you're trying to teach a class and something is going on in your class, it's disrupting the learning. So somebody's in the back, they're talking real loud, they're playing, I don't know, they're horse playing with their friend, and, and people are starting to pay attention to them. They're not listening to you anymore. Everybody understand this question? I said you can use force when conditions are harmful to learning. So that's what I'm describing right now. I'm sorry I didn't lead that off. Right, so you can remove this, you can ask them to leave, that's the best, it's verbal, right? Leave, no, oh, leave, you know, and then you can escalate so on and so on. So that would be a condition. What else? And by the way, those are all things that I got from the Department of Education as to why they think you can use force. I didn't make any of that stuff up. So, you can take it to the bank, as they say. All right, once again, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure, and I hope to see you all perhaps next time.